Hey everyone, welcome to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast, where we highlight everyday humans doing crazy, amazing things. People just like you and me who utilize their time, talents, and resources to make the world a better place. I'm Katrina Carlson. And I'm Jefferson Denham. We want to thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are on this crazy, amazing planet. We believe it is more important than ever to stay connected, stay positive, and stay active. If you agree, you are in the right place. Agreed, Jefferson. And we're so glad you're with us today. Uh, in this episode, we're going to equip you with a how-to guide for safety, something we all can use. And I know mm. I can always use the reminder myself. And Me too. Yeah, I, I would yeah. think so. And we're enlisting the expertise of our guests, Jeff Wohler and Kaylin Washington, to do so. Jeff is the president and CEO of the San Diego Harbor Police Foundation, and Keelan is a program facilitator for multiple anti-human trafficking programs. Mm. Their stories are all about turning darkness into hope. So along with discussing general safety tips in recognition of Human Trafficking Awareness Month, we will also be discovering surprising facts about human trafficking, along with powerful stories of hope and redemption. Absolutely. So let's get right to our conversation. We always want to express how much we truly appreciate you and want to remind you that you, you are, are crazy, crazy amazing. amazing. I want you to Hi, this is Sonali Pereira Bridges, and you're listening to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast with Katrina Carlson and Jefferson Denham. Hey, Crazy Amazing Humans community. We're here with Keelan Washington and Jeff Wohler. Keelan Washington is a lived experience expert, advocate, and public speaker in the field of human sex trafficking. Her dynamic work includes designing reintegration programming for survivors, including therapy, court advocacy, and career and educational readiness for Generate Hope's safe houses. She has educated law enforcement, industry leaders, churches, and higher education institutions nationally and internationally. Keelan shares her story and expertise in the documentaries, It's Happening Right Here, and the soon to be released, The Journey. And Jeff Wohler served as an agent for the U.S. Treasury Department. Since then, he has successfully managed a multitude of companies at the president and chief executive officer level. In 2018, Jeff co-founded the San Diego Harbor Police Foundation and currently serves as president and CEO. Jeff's leadership resulted in the creation of the training Help Stop Human Trafficking, and he facilitates this training throughout Southern California. Keelan and Jeff, welcome to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast, and thanks so much for being with us today. Thank thanks. you so much for having us here. Yeah, this is exciting. Well, we're so glad to have you. And, you know, with it being the beginning of the new year, Jefferson and I were talking about safety and awareness now that we're in full swing, and we thought this could be a really good time to remind ourselves and get an update on general tips for safety in 2023. So, Jeff, with you being in law enforcement over the years, can you start with some general safety pointers you might have for our audience? Well, I think in today's environment, so many people are attached physically, emotionally, and, you know, uh, all of their manners with their uh, their devices, you know, their phones. Yeah. I'm sorry, Jeff, I, I was looking at my phone. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> and, and therein lies a major problem in today's world in terms of self, self-awareness self and safety is people are so attached to these devices that they're not doing a 360 lookabout on a regular basis to keep themselves aware of their surroundings. I think that's probably the most important thing that I can tell anyone for themselves, their children, their family members. Great. Right. That and you know, a uh, lot of sense. And I was talking to my wife before uh, telling her about our conversation, upcoming conversation. And she says, you know, uh, it's good to always be aware. But if you're a woman, especially if you're a woman, you should be doubly or triply Tripoli? That's a country. That's a town somewhere. <laughs> anyway, uh, but triple aware of your surroundings and what's going on. And uh, that's true, too. Right. Women have to be especially vigilant. 
Yeah, of course. Um, much, much more so than ever before. Or, well, I'm not sure if that's correct, if it was ever before, because in the past, we didn't really have so many eyes on us 24-7 with cameras everywhere. That's true. So, uh, you know, it's probably been going on forever, but certainly women are more vulnerable when it comes to, you know, uh, physical attack, you know, theft or rape, all, you know, all of these horrific things that happen to, I think, women more often than men. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, there are the obvious, general, you know, common sense things we should always kind of remind ourselves about, you know, ATM, you know, awareness, valuables awareness, you know, meeting new people, uh, you know, try to always have someone with you or let people know where you are. Uh, you know, those are pretty standard common sense items. Uh, but today, since it's human traffic and month, you know, I think, you know, as we get into our conversation a little more deeply, I think we, Caitlin and I would like to explore some more red flags, as it were, in terms mm -hmm. of what to look for uh, in this this world of human trafficking, which, by the way, is prolific. It's, it's everywhere. There's, there, there, like in San Diego County, every single high school has human trafficking events have occurred on campus, you know, with students. So it, it's not it's not one of those it's not in my backyard kind of a thing because it is in your backyard. Wow. And Keelan, I know that you have some uh, other tips to share with us too because it's not just physically being stalked; it's also stalked online. This is social oh, yeah. media, right? It's not just like oh my phone's in the way; it's like actual data being stalked. So uh, I'm sure you have some safety tips you could add as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're just over consumed with the online presence in any form, regardless if it's our social media, it's chat rooms, it's the gaming systems, right? Like any entry into our homes comes from a lot of the online services. And so what we see, especially when I'm working with the youth is that they're spending a lot of time behind the screen. And so when they're doing that, we actually have cases of a child who was playing roadblocks. We have one on roadblocks on a game called Fortnite and where the person on the other side, because there's a chat feature associated with it, was actually talking to this individual and ended up trafficking her from her home. And then they ended up finding her in Las Vegas. And so these cases are happening all the time. So when we're looking at being preventative, there's a couple of things. How can we as parents really be involved in what's happening on the devices with our children? How can we become more involved, even though our kids don't like it? It's one of our first responsibilities is their safety. How, I mean, we hear it on, on the show MTV when it talks about catfishing, right? These people are here to manipulate, to get what they want from the other person on the other side of the screen. So sometimes it means that we're not accepting friend requests from people we do not know. We're not giving out our personal information on where we work or what school do we attend. Another part of that also is when we think about protecting women, I always look at how then do we be preventative? I think we've identified a little bit of what that looks like, but I think on the opposite end is how do we teach the men who are growing up in our society what treating women correctly looks like on both ends, male and female? How do we teach them what respect is? How do we teach them that buying people is not okay or pornography is not okay? Anything that diminishes the human value is I I'm a firm believer is really where we get the opportunity to be preventative in all aspects. Could you define catfishing for our audience, just for those who don't yes. know? Yeah, absolutely. So catfishing is identified as if somebody is online, what they will do is instead of using their own profile, their own location, their own age, they have stolen somebody's picture online, which is really easy today to do today. We can copy and paste a picture on the internet. And what they'll do is they'll put that picture on those social media site and act as somebody else. And so we've seen people go through a couple weeks to years of acting like somebody else and manipulating people or getting money from them or exploiting them. Uh, wow. Um, yeah. Go ahead, just, Jeff. Just a quick comment, you know, and, and children in particular hate this idea, but, uh, you know, we promote it wherever we can. Is If you insist on having a phone for your children, buy a dumb phone. And a dumb phone allows, you know, one-on-one -on -one phone communication and texting and that's it. 
And so, you know, if you're worried about knowing where your child is, you can easily do that. You can embed in that in those phones, you know, tracking mechanisms. And and you know, it's such a simple little thing. And you know, I grew up in an age where we we didn't have phones. The vast majority of human trafficking did not ever occur on a phone. Today, it occurs on phones a lot. And wow. you know, we can talk more about that. It's really uncomfortable. I'm a mother of three, um, and I've uh, some of them are a little older in their mid twenties. And you know, at first they weren't really involved in the digital world. It wasn't as strong for them. It wasn't as prevalent. But we have a third who is, you know, she was kind of a digital native from the get go, right when she was born. At a, you know, she's now seventeen, and it is really uncomfortable to not know who she's communicating with and we've tried to put these like net nannies on and different things and then it limits them from being able to do certain research for papers and things and wow it's so challenging for parents these days with that and you know so any of us could be you know subject to some kind of fraud or some kind of you know, who knows what through the internet. Um, Keelan, I wanted to turn to your personal story where, where you, that you have regarding this and uh, just was wondering if you could share that briefly with us. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as a lived experience expert and what that kind of means when we're talking about human trafficking is that I'm a survivor of human trafficking myself. And so what that kind of looked like in my story was like, I met my trafficker when I was 14, right? When we're talking about teenagers, when we're talking about how to keep them safe, I think a part of that was there was no real education on what is human trafficking and the only education that we had, it it came from the movies, which is completely false half the time. And so I met my trafficker while I was at the mall with a group of friends and it seemed super casual. I exchanged my phone number with him. And one thing kind of led to another, like our phone calls led, you know, our text messages led to phone calls, phone calls led to us hanging out in person. And by this time, he's taking the opportunity to get to know me. What are my struggles? Who am I? What are my flaws? And even at this time, he's picking me up from school. He's dropping me off at my home. He knows exactly where I live. He's got the opportunity to understand who my friends are. And then he really started to exploit that. And so one conversation we had was, he's telling me, you know, I'm not able to to support my home financially. I need help with my car payment. I'm not able to do this. Can you help me? And so in this, by the time this happened, this is already about three or four months of us, what we call the boyfriending. So he acted like my boyfriend. He was showering me with gifts. He was taking me out on dates, telling me that he loved me and that he was there to care for me. So when this conversation came up of, well, now I need you to do something. And so it's hard, especially at the age of 14. It's like, okay, what you're presented with something that you're kind of fully blindsided by because we don't believe that it happens here in the first place. It must be a third world issue was my thought. And so I got into the life of exploitation. And after a short time of that, I was sexually assaulted by one of my buyers at 14. And I remember coming back into the hotel room and telling them like, well, I can't do this. Like, we'll find another way to get the money. What, what are something else that we can do? And as soon as those words fell out of my mouth, he beat me until I was unconscious. And the whole time telling me that I couldn't leave, that if I tried to leave, not only would he kill me, but he'd kill my mother too. And I remember being in that moment and I woke up a while after and he came back into the room and he told me to get in the car. And of course, like at that age and at the assault that I had just faced, well, I did what I was told. And at that moment, he ended up taking me out of the city of San Diego, and he had sold me all across the United States, over 12 states in total. Um, The whole time I was being bought and sold to at least 10 men a day, if not more. If I did not hit my quota, I had a quota that I had to make $2,000 or more. So if that meant I was out in the middle of the snow for more than 12 hours, well, that's what it meant. Uh, My abuse, there was a point in this because he trafficked me for almost four years. And so at one point I tried to leave. If I just leave, like, you know, maybe I'll survive, you know, maybe, maybe he won't come find my family. And the time that I did try to leave, he ended up finding me um, when I reached another state. And in that moment, like not only did my, not only was I being abused, but it turned it up. It turned it ended up turning into torture. So I'm also a survivor of torture. 
And so I lived this life for three and a half, four years. And I think the hard part about that was, again, my age and being sold in different states where people of all economic backgrounds, and I mean, we're talking teachers, we're talking lawyers, we're talking NFL, we're talking NBA, and everywhere in between, the people in the jail systems. I mean, like this is this was the life that I lived for almost four years. And so being in a space, which I'm so thankful for the work that I do now and working with Jeff is bringing that awareness. But what was interesting is not knowing what trafficking was and getting a firsthand experience and it changed my life forever. And you can help people like no one else can because you know the story. Right. So, Kaylin. (laughs) <laughs> okay, first of all, wow. Uh, mm-hmm. And to Katrina's point, I think that it's one thing for people in that world to hear from well-meaning adults. It's another to hear from someone like you. And I just imagine that there's all kinds of breakthroughs with that. But help us understand what exactly is human trafficking, especially in the U.S.? Yes, great question. It's interesting because I I love the movie Taken, but it does paint this very different picture, right? The idea that these girls or boys are thrown into a car and then they disappear forever, right? And so what it really looks like is that these perpetrators, these traffickers are taking the time to understand the vulnerabilities, mostly predominantly women in the U.S., and understanding their vulnerabilities boyfriending them, acting like they're going to be loved, like they're going to be cared for. And then they're ending up selling them, right? Like now, now there's a ton of sexual assault involved. There's abuse involved, but it's more subtle than what we see in the movies. I think also the idea sometimes is when we, you know, some movies get it correct or shows where it's like, you'll see this girl and she's on the corner and she's wearing next to nothing. And a buyer's coming to pick her up, drops her off and she's still on the corner. So we still have this idea sometimes of what prostitution is, which is it's a choice, which now that we're understanding, it's like, no, this is trafficking. But the question often comes up with, well, why didn't she leave? She looks like she's free. We see this with DV victims as well. Like, why didn't you just walk away? And the truth behind that is that, especially in my case was I was isolated. So um, victims are often isolated. So we're taking out of our comfort and our environment. He had all of my documentation. So I was not allowed to have my ID. I was not any of the money that was made through being sold. I never got a dollar of that. I had the threats and the abuse. But on top of that, in those, in in that three and a half years, nobody came and said anything to me. There was not one person who said, this girl looks young. Do you need some help? But because it was uncomfortable for them, they ended up turning the other way, which reinforced that what was happening was my fault or there was no help out there. And that's that's how most of the time what we're seeing with survivors is that's what it's look that's what it looks like. Not only are they being sold on the street, a part of my exploitation was I was sold on Craigslist. Like the place we go to buy to get a job or get free stuff, well, you are able to buy children on there. And they're and the buyers are coming to the hotels, raping the victims and then leaving and nobody says a word. Not not the hotel security, not not nobody at the front desk. They they turn a blind eye to it then. And so it's it's just a little different now. How did your family react to this? What was happening within your home? Where did they think you were? How did that how, what happened there? So a part of that was that my mom ended up trying to find me. Um, she was able to get a little bit of information on who I was with and found out that he was part of a trafficking ring. So it wasn't just him. It was a ring that was all over the U.S. And so it was easy for him to transport me to different states. But what she did was she put up flyers. You know, my child's missing. You, We see them all the time in Walmart or pictures of kids that she tried. She got law enforcement involved. By the time that that had already happened, I was already out of the state. And so not only that, and the reason why I know what had happened was because about a month and a half after he had taken me out of the city, um, he was watching the news and a picture of him and me came up on the news channel that they were out there looking for me. But by that time I was already gone. And so my, I'm very fortunate now that me and my mother, I mean, we were two You know, we're just together all the time, which is amazing. But looking as a mother myself, it's like, what do you do when somebody has taken your kid and is selling them across the country? And my mom still to this day has to 
work on that idea, even though that I'm home. My brother is out there looking for me. And I remember talking to my brother one day and he was like, he knew what was happening, right? Like being in a condition of seeing the worst parts of humanity and being raped every day. Like a conversation he had was like, I used to pray that either you would get out or God would take your life so you didn't have to suffer anymore. Oh my gosh. And that was just the conditions of my family at that time. Wow. Wow. You so know, they okay. actually knew. Wow. That's not so Right. Way. And they were looking for you. Oh, yeah. Okay. I have another question about this. And I think that most of our audience is not aware of the ins and outs of this uh, horrific experience. What are some surprising aspects of this that people just don't know? Like you alluded to the fact that the majority are girls. But boys are trafficked too. I think I read somewhere that 30% of the traffickers are female. That was a surprise. Mm -hmm. So what are some surprising uh, aspects of this that people just don't know? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We tend to see that it is more predominantly female here as far as the demand goes. And that goes to just show that most of our buyers are men. Um, we do have male victims that are here too. Um, this, just the demand side is predominantly female. But what we see sometimes with female traffickers is that it's easy to fly under the radar if you're a female. What we also tend to see is that not all female traffickers are actually traffickers, but they were recruited themselves. And so in the life of exploitation, there's this hierarchy that happens. So you'll have a guy who has a stable of four women and whoever makes the most money, um, he'll put her in charge of the other women. But a part of that is saying, if you if you go and find me somebody else to add to our stable, I won't abuse you. I'll treat you better. I'll give you more privileges than the other women. So not only are we seeing female traffickers, what we're also seeing in our school districts is now these girls are going into the high school because you're, if I'm coming to another girl and they're saying, hey, let's hang out, my red flag doesn't go up. And so traffickers know that. So they're sending in also children to come and recruit other children. And this is not third, this is not third world countries. This is all 50 yeah. states in the United yeah. States, right? Wow. Yes. So every state has confirmed cases. So it's actually all around us. And that that's a very surprising fact, you know, because you just don't, like you said, we all have our preconceived notions of what this really is. And so what can we look out for? to help us identify human trafficking that might be happening right around us? I think it also, for me, it always started with education. I'm a firm believer that if I would have known what trafficking was, maybe that would have stopped me from being exploited myself. Mm -hmm. So it starts with education. It starts with us understanding who our children are talking to, because again, my mother was a single parent. And so she, while she's trying her best, there's also vulnerabilities that stand in that space, right? Mm -hmm. We're looking at, we see our foster kids who are being exploited. One thing that I, that I love to highlight is just like, we as humans are conditioned to be loved. And so when there is a lack of love, it is easy for exploiters to come and do that. This is why we see people get in bad relationships all the time. It's not that they're bad people, it's that they're seeking to be loved. And so we see that as a vulnerability is, okay, what am I seeking and why am I seeking it? How do we better support our children, but our communities? How do we have the conversation of um, human trafficking in our homes, not just with our kids, but with our communities, with our families, with our teachers, with the people we come in contact with all the time. But we'll see some of the warning signs when we see a kid who's coming into school and she has bruises or she has branding. Um, a part of the branding process is when a trafficker has a victim and he tattoos them. And so we've seen tattoos as far as dollar signs, initials. I've known one of, um, one of the survivors that I've worked with before who had an actual barcode on her. And that was her trafficker branded her in that way. So we see that a lot of the time with some of the victims who come into our care. But also the idea is like, when we look at these women and, and our first idea is like, well, they're promiscuous or they're over sexualized. We miss the concept of sometimes what's really happening because it makes us feel uncomfortable. But if we start to identify what's really going on with this individual and keeping our eyes, not only our eyes, but our hearts open to humanity, we begin to shift a little bit of what human trafficking can actually look like. And that all of us have vulnerability. All of us have the vulnerability for that. Wow. You know, this is this is a fascinating conversation. Of course, 
I've known Keelan a long time and I've heard her story many, many times and it, it, it never it never changes in terms of how it affects me. But uh, you, you mentioned a couple of things. You've used the word youth a number of times and you've used uh, the prostitution and you've used uh, sex. And so what Keelan and I in our training tried to do is shift the dynamic and how people actually use the right kind of language. It's like when you teach your children about sex education. So what these women are going through is not sex because the connotation when you're having sex is that there's feelings and mutuality and caring and love. But in fact, what's happening with um, trafficked victims is they're being raped and they're being raped multiple times every single day. And Keelan's quota was $2,000. In San Diego County, it's anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500. And that's, and that's just, per day? That's per day. That's per day. Per day. And they don't, they don't get time off for good behavior. They have no holidays. You know, it's it's 24-7. Mm. And, you know, if you don't get your quota, like Keelan says, and I know that Keelan was trafficked in in the in the snow in Colorado, you know, standing out there scantily clad, just trying to make her quota however she could do it. Um, the other the other term that was used was youth, and in San Diego County prior to the pandemic, the average age average underscore was 16 years old. Well, today it's less than 14 years old. And in fact, you know, if you want to, you know, a showstopper, we had a case last year of a woman that was trafficking her two-year-old daughter. What? So, yeah, you heard me. Two-year-old daughter was being trafficked. Okay. I mean, there, there are plenty of sick people out there that will pay money for aberrant sick behavior. And so when you think about healing situation, and this was a, you know, a few years ago where human trafficking was not nearly as uh, well known as it is today, uh, you know, people just didn't care. They, they didn't want to get involved. Wow. So, okay. Jeff, I, I have to ask you, because um, Keelan was talking about, you know, how she was groomed, grooming. I guess I'm going to ask you how to define that for our audience uh, sure. in regards to human trafficking. But also for those of us who maybe maybe we are seeing something, how can we look at grooming happening Define it for us and help us identify it, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, first of all, you, you need to identify the traffickers as a very sophisticated group of mostly men in gangs. And in Keelan's you know, situation, she was part of her trafficker was part of a ring. Well, that ring was a gang. And, you know, it could be M13, it could be the Bloods and the Crips or, you know, whatever the flavor of the month is. But trust me. These are highly sophisticated, brutal, um, you know, individuals who have no care whatsoever for that person other than she's property, she's chattel, and she is treated, you know, accordingly, not as a human being. Uh, there are hundreds of cases throughout the world. Remember, this is the second largest crime in the world next to drugs. And, you know, the difference between drugs and human trafficking is if, if I'm a drug trafficker, I sell you the drugs, Jeff, and they're gone. But with human trafficking, I have a renewable resource. So I'm going to use that resource over and over and over and over again until she can no longer perform. And when that happens, very often they disappear. You mean for good, like people don't know where they went? As in dead. Okay, got it. Wow. Um, so you were, yeah. you know, you had mentioned on a previous conversation we had that there was someone in Malibu, because I think people don't understand that this is literally families, they don't even want to talk about it if their kid gets caught up in this kind of thing. And well, yeah, and I hate to be, you know, correct, but that's the nature of what we do, is that a lot of times, these women are being trafficked by their own families or someone within their family sphere. Very often the, the, the victim knows the trafficker and Keeling can talk more about that because she, you know, she works every day. 
in, in that industry. And, you know, I do as well, but she's she has a life experience. Uh, so uh, and that adds to the, you know, the difficulty in in prosecuting the difficulty. And let's say that the, the young woman, 13, 14, whatever age she is, is traffic and she manages to get out. Well, and if her family was the, you know, the the organization that was trafficking on her, where's she going to go? You know, mm. her, right, resources, right. her resources are very, very limited. We just recently brought a woman from North Carolina here with her eight-year-old daughter, and she's pregnant by her trafficker. Uh, she managed to escape, and uh, that was, you know, right after he literally broke her front teeth out and tried to run her over in his car. So we managed to get her on a plane and brought her here to San Diego. And now she's, you know, in a safe place. But she recently learned that her brother raped her when she was four years old and that her grandmother was the major force in getting her into the life of sex trafficking. So, and th this is a common story. I mean, it's this wow. is not unique. That's this is the happens. United States. It's okay. happening right here. Right. Yeah. And okay. so back to your question, Kat, you know, Malibu, I mean, in San Diego and like where you live, we have some of the richest zip codes in the world. And we have documented cases in those zip codes, in those high schools, you know, with children being trafficked. Yeah. So to right. make, it doesn't happen in my yard is a fallacy. Okay. You got You've given us so many important things to think about. Can we distill down some of those vulnerabilities in a list just for everyone listening so that we can know, you know, sort of where those points are that we need to be careful? So I, I think Keelan and I can, we, we could talk all day long about the list. But the pandemic has been a horrific boom for the traffickers. The pandemic has created an atmosphere that highlights the vulnerabilities more than ever before in the world of human trafficking. And that's because so many of these, we, we keep saying young girls because it, it is mostly girls. Uh, and, but you're right, Jeff, you know, there is a, a relatively small percentage uh, that are boys or young men. But the vulnerability has occurred, number one, they're no longer involved so much in their social world where they were out, you know, uh, at the mall, or they were, you know, out visiting friends, going to restaurants, doing all the things that young people do, riding their barks and bikes, going to the park. Uh, because, well, I mean, it's a little bit better now, but the pandemic, you know, uh, curtailed that dramatically. They weren't in school. So if they were being groomed, they didn't really have much of a chance to talk to their other girlfriend. And, hey, I met this really cool guy. Or uh, there's this young girl from Santee and, and she wants to meet for coffee. She's really cool and she dresses really, she's really hip, all those cool things. And, and so, so, you know, even though this young girl is feeling like she's being loved upon, she's being groomed. And, and that's because she's on social media more than she was before, because before she was in school or she was going to sporting events or she was participating in sports. Uh, those things went away. And now, and, you know, during that time frame, the traffickers, their, their numbers went up exponentially. So it's like when, when you these groomers look for to to Kat's question and what Keelan alluded to earlier as well. So these groomers look for those openings. Like, what is your most vulnerable spot? Mm -hmm. And then they just push on that until you're almost brainwashed. You're you're lost in a kind of a cult situation. Is that correct? You are in a cult situation in the sense that there's a there's a phrase that we use in in this these conversations about the life is what it's called. So there's a term that we use when talking to people and it's called invisible handcuffs. And if you go to our website, helpstophumantrafficking.org, on the, on the top right-hand corner, you'll see a, a logo and it'll have a young girl's hand spread out and there's a butterfly escaping the life and whatnot. But if you look carefully around the, that, that visual, there are these muted, chains and the chains are, are are barely visible and that's because you know these women they Keelan is a perfect example she was she was shipped all around the United States often by herself 
you know, someone would drop her off at the airport or the bus station or wherever, and then there would be someone to meet her. But she could have, you know, to the normal person, you're saying, well, if you if you don't like this life so much, why don't you just go over and tap that police officer on the shoulder and say, hey, help me, you know, hey, help me. Well, no, that's that's nearly impossible because she's been manipulated with fear, coercion, um, hostility, uh, you know, the the potential of your family being being attacked. I mean, we had a young girl that was trying to get out of the life. She she was noticed by one of our police officers at the airport. The officer approached her. She said, "Yeah, I I I'm in I'm in trouble, but my trafficker has my dog." Remember the story, Keelan? And uh, and my trafficker told me, "If I tried to leave, I'm going to kill your dog." Well, so she didn't leave right then, but the trafficker found out that she spoke with the police officer. And that trafficker killed the dog in front of her to make a point. So not only are they manipulative, but they are vicious. People, they harm people. They're very wow. dangerous. And, Invisible you know, handcuffs. Yeah. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. If you come across a situation that you believe involves some trafficking, the number one rule is do not approach. Do not do that, because not only are the traffickers wow. extremely dangerous, but the victim is now probably going to pay the price, even though it's not her fault. Wow. So what do you call 911? What is it that you do? So you think what, what we recommend is, it, and, you know, uh, we can talk about the signs and, you know, all of the various issues that might alert you to something that's going on but it's to call local law enforcement. And if the, the victim looks like they're a minor, and, you know, of course, they dress up, so they, you know, they, they try to look, the traffic tries to make them look older. But even so, you, you can usually spot, you know, if they're younger. Uh, like Keelan, she was 14 years old, sitting in a casino uh, next to her, her buyer, uh, scantily clad, you know, drinking, smoking, whatever. And, you know, who wouldn't have noticed that? But no one said it worked. Um, anyway, so what we recommend is call local law enforcement. If it looks like it's a minor, that's a 911 call. That's exigent situation that's, uh, that that child is in danger. So call 911. Okay. More and more police departments, dispatchers are trained, you know, on how to handle that. We have a very special team in our department, the Port of San Diego Harbor Police. We have uh, 14, sorry, 13 officers that are human trafficking liaison officers. So they're specifically trained to look for all the signs and more importantly, what to do with that victim once, once they approach, because it's a make or break situation. If someone came up to Keelan when she was being trafficked and, you know, said, Hey, you know, how do you like having sex for money? How much of them, how much of that money do you get? You know, you get to keep all the stupid questions that people ask. But these officers aren't going to do that. They're going to be empathetic. They're going to listen and they're going to have the, the right resources and tools to respond appropriately to this young person. Because oftentimes it's three, four, five times trying before they actually get out of the life. And so you know, you, so, you just have to chip away at it. Wow. So Jeff and Keelan, you both are now, you know, educating people. You're putting out programs to help people with this. How did the two of you connect and start working together? What is that history? I was contacted by them. Um, they were looking for some additional information. They wanted to make sure that the training that was put together was not only accurate, but it was trauma informed. And so the best way to do that is to get somebody who's actually lived the life of exploitation. And I think what's been beautiful over the last couple of years is that's kind of how our relationship started. And we started to get down to what, what needs to be taught. How does the tur tourism industry, how are we supporting the employee? How are we supporting the survivors? So we spent a lot of hours getting down to what does that look like and what does this training need to be? And so we've just been blessed to be able to jump into that and continue this amazing work and relationship that we have now where we are stepping in environments, not only just with here in San Diego, 
but we're going up to LA. We're talking to hotel staff. We're talking to the casinos. Like who, where are these survivors at? Because wherever they're at, those are the people that we need to train. And so it's just been remarkable how we've been able to continue the work that we do. But the the joke uh, on our team, there are three of us in our team, our human trafficking team, Keelan, myself, and Corey Voss. And Corey Voss said uh, she's an um, amazing photojournalist with uh, 18 Emmys and Golden Mike Awards, and she's just fascinating. And so we do go around to these various places, and Corey and I laugh about it. We say, we say well, why don't we just sit in the car and we'll send Keelan in because she's really the <laughs> one that everyone wants to listen to anyway. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to some good old white guy talking about <laughs> human trafficking that's never happened to him. So, but, but when Keelan enters the room, everybody listens. Mm. Absolutely. I think our audience is agreeing with you, yeah, Jeff. Although, yes. although I'm not going to diminish, yeah, Jeff, your that's right. part. You play. So you co-founded and currently serve as president and CEO of San Diego Harbor Police Foundation, as we said. And you are, you've created the training Help Stop Human Trafficking, which we've talked about. How would you concisely describe your mission? What's your mission statement with this? So when we started looking at this, the former chief of police for the Harbor Police Department, uh, we decided we we're going to have three legs to our stool. And one leg was officer wellness, of course. The other leg was we've adopted a K-8 school and a disadvantaged economically a lower K-8 through school in the Barrio Logan district. But the third component was human trafficking. And so when we started on this journey, my my vision was we'll just shop around the nation and find the best training out there. We'll buy it and then we'll, you know, then we'll give it out for free throughout San Diego County to hospitality, tourism, hospitality, you know, hotels, motels, restaurants, and the airport convention center, you know, those those venues. And what we found in our research, and we, we investigated 19 entities in the United States that actually provide human trafficking training. And, you know, to be candid, I was not impressed. Most of the training was too generic. Uh, didn't, uh, it was either exploitative in the sense that it, you know, tried to create this fantasy environment, or it was boring as hell. Uh, or or it just didn't hit the mark. And so what Corey and I decided after uh, about a year's worth of deep dive research was we're going to do our own training and we're going to customize it and we're going to make it just important enough to create passion in people. And I think that's the mission. When you talk about, you know, what is really our mission, Jeff? Mm -hmm. it's, I, want, I want people to walk away from our training and, you know, they can do it online 100%. It's no cost. Helpstophumantrafficking.org. All you have to do is click the button, request access, and we'll provide, you know, access to the training. We want them to come away from that training just a little bit pissed off. Oh, that's great. Emotionally engaged, yeah. Yeah. Can you, just because sometimes your um, volume goes out a little, can you repeat that uh, website for our audience again? It's www.help stop human trafficking.org and just push the request access button once you're on the site and the rest is easy that's amazing help that stop human trafficking.org thank you and, and jeff the way that we customize it is that we created six segments so if you're in housekeeping for instance that segment is just about housekeeping uh, and that version also is in spanish uh, or if you're at front desk, so there's that. If you're valet, uh, or if you're hotel security, or if you're food and beverage, so those are you know the four segments that sort of focus on the tourism industry. But if you're in an airport worker or a convention worker, where you have a lot of traffic coming and going, that we have two segments in there. So so and plus we customize the visuals so that you know the person that's watching watching the, the training who works in housekeeping, they can go, oh, I know that hotel, or, you know, maybe that's where I work, or, you know, I, I recognize that iconoclastic building. So, you know, it, it creates a sense of community. And then hopefully, like, like I mentioned earlier, just a little bit of passion so that, you know, they go, now I can become 
maybe I can become that person that saves someone's life. Because quite honestly, don't get that person out of the life, their chances of survival are not that good. So you, you all are doing incredible work. And um, so you you two have worked together, but also I wanted to turn to Keelan a little bit and tell us her, um, a little bit about Generate Hope's safe houses and, and how, Keelan, how are you involved with them? Yeah, so here at Generate Hope, we are a long-term residential program for survivors of sex trafficking. What we really, our goal and our mission is to help women who have come from exploitation and help them reintegrate back into society successfully. That is a hard thing to do when we look at not only the length of time that they were trafficked, but the abuse that was associated with it. And then understanding like, being in an environment where you're seeing the worst parts of humanity, how then do you change that mental shift to even be able to trust people again? Mm. And so what we do here and what is very important to us is how do we remove every single barrier so we give them an honest opportunity to honestly heal? So a part of that is our program is absolutely free. We are a two-year program. We have They have their own individual bedrooms. We provide uh, personal therapy. They're uh, five therapeutic groups a week. We They have their own financial advisors. We look at different life skills. We have scholarship programs for them to get a full ride in their education and degree program. We help them with their housing after they leave the life. We help them with donations with cars. I mean, we really took the opportunity to say, how do we remove this and give them, how do we, they've been robbed by society. How do we give them a piece of that back? And so how it was interesting how I ended up getting into the work here at Generate Hope because I worked in corporate America. My whole thing after exploitation was I don't want nobody to know. So I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be judged. I'm going to be looked at as less than because I had slept with so many people. And I remember being in corporate America and, and this self-serving position of, okay, I'm doing great. I'm living financially. This is this is wonderful. And it, and it hit this pivotal point was, I want to be a part of something that's bigger than myself. How do I find my voice when the world is telling me that I need to stay silent because it makes them uncomfortable? And so I started to really dive in and look into what was available, what, what was out there in the realm of human trafficking. And I was able to find Generate Help. So I came on as a volunteer for about a year. And then a position opened up where I was able to be what we call a resident guide. So I was living in the home with the ladies. I was supporting them. I was helping them. I mean, from the basics of when survivors come into our program that sometimes they've never went grocery shopping. I mean, I had a survivor come in and was like, I don't know how to, like I was never able to go. So sometimes as basic as going to the grocery store, sometimes where our beginning starts with them. And so I did that for a while and I've been here for over three years now. And so my position is program specialist where now I oversee our safe houses. I make sure that our classes are effective, that they are, they're going to help them get to the next stage in their healing is what we're teaching effective. So I'm able to not only do that in their educational piece, but I get to do life with them. So I meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. I help them if they're going into the court systems. If they're looking to press charges against their trafficker, I am there every step of the way. A part of the exploitation process in some of our laws and legislative is that a lot of the victims who come to our program were actually re-victimized because they were thrown in jail saying that it was your fault. So you get a misdemeanor, which was um, solicitation with the intent of prostitution. And so now we have to go to the court and fight that stigma as well. California, we've done a great job, but that's not the same all over the country. And so I, I mean, my biggest thing is that I get to do life with them, but I get to see them from their brokenness from the time that they enter into our program into the time where they're getting their first apartment they're getting married, they're getting degrees, they're having children, and they're having successful lives despite the trauma that they faced. Wow. wow. You're dealing with these, these women and girls who have just been released, who've just gotten away. And, you know, I'm sure you have a story for that. Is there any part of that story of what did, you know, what made the difference in you getting out of your situation? 
the success rate of survivors coming from that life to being successful is very slim. Um, as you can imagine, not only with the type of trauma and abuse, but substance abuse sometimes with some of our cases. And I, I think what was pivotal for me when I got out and now I'm in this world of like, okay, I'm so broken. I've been raped thousands of times. Now what? Like now, now, now what the last place that I was exploited was Colorado. And so I remember reaching out to my mother and, and finally getting the opportunity to talk to her again and was like, I'm coming home. And so when I moved back out here, I had no idea what to do. I had missed all of my high school. I had no education. I had no social skills. And so I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to try to go to adult school to get my GED. Had no idea what my life was going to look like at that point. And I remember sitting in the class one day and we were working through this and I was working on my GED and it hit me like, well, what if, what if I am able to get this degree? What if I'm able to heal? What if I'm able to get back everything that was taken from me and being able to overcome that and be successful despite my trauma? And so that one question of what if has actually pushed me and continues to push me in the work that I do with the survivors inside the home and outside of it as well. She's working on her master's degree. So <laughs> there's like a boss, there's no <laughs> stopping this woman. I'm telling you. I have a question for both of you, uh, because it's just so exciting to hear how you're attacking this situation and providing hope. Can you each give us an example of, and I'm sure there's a million of them, but just one transformational story that you've seen that you've been a part of through the work that you do. And Jeff, uh, I'd like to start with you. So Keelan and Corey and I had this uh, training at uh, one of the casinos here in San Diego, and, and Keelan mentioned this, uh, casinos are really hot spots in terms of human trafficking potential. Uh, so we've been you know, out training hundreds and hundreds of people at these casinos, but we normally our training is online, but we go in person uh, for the casinos. Uh, we show our 20 minute training, and then we open it up for a Q&A and some additional information. But we did this training at this casino. There were, I don't know, two, three hundred people. And uh, the next day I got a phone call from one of the people that was in the training, a, a woman. She was one of their security managers. And she said, I think my daughter is being groomed. I said, OK, let's talk about it. And it was he says, and the reason I, I think so is last night at dinner, I was telling my family all about the training I had that day and how remarkable and how impactful it was. And my young, was she 14 or 15, Keila? I can't remember. Her, her she daughter, was 14. 14. Her, her daughter said, Mom, I think I'm being groomed based on what you're telling me. And so I had the wow. moment to take screenshots of her daughter's phone and her computer. And uh, we evaluated. I took it over to my, my uh, human trafficking liaison officer team. And we looked at it and we said, yep, yeah, sure enough, this, this girl is being groomed. And the way they, they it's, it's very subtle, Jeff. It's really subtle, Jeff. Mm. Uh, and this person was being groomed by a young woman, like Keelan alluded to. This was a teenager, probably 14, 15 years old, licking. Yeah. And so there's this whole process. But, but what happened as a result of this mother paying attention to the training and reaching out and calling Jeff Wool or whomever, Keelan, whoever, and saying, maybe something's off. It, it's, here's the pivotal issue. You don't need to be right to say something. This is so important. If you have a suspicion, your gut's telling you something's off, act on it. So what if you're wrong? So what if a police officer approaches and says, are you okay? Do you need help? and you're wrong, it ends up that it's a grandfather and his granddaughter, and they're off on some holiday together, you know, and everything else is fine, you know, and, and, and these officers, are, they're trained, they'll go, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that that uh, whoever called was 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 wrong, but, you know, thank you very much for listening to me, and, you know, you know who's going to who's going to be upset about seeing law enforcement doing their job? <laughs> Better safe than sorry. Absolutely. Exactly. Right, a right. little bit, because so, you never know when they're going to actually catch the real thing. You have to kind of so step we were up. able to redirect that young girl's 
profile canceled. Hallelujah. Out. You know, everything was was wiped out and reinitiated, and you know, so that so. is a great story, Keelan. Do you have a, a story? I'm sure you have a million of them. Can you tell us a story also from your perspective or your experience? Yeah, absolutely. You're right. I have a lot, and so picking one is a little bit difficult. But I had to think back to what was what was the most impactful for me. And so I was working with a survivor who was trafficked through her family, familial trafficking from the time that she could remember for the age she was two and she could remember it. Um, And by the time she got to our program, she was 19, 19 or 20. Um, So that whole time um, she was trafficked step parent, I mean, sold the entire time, forced to sit in a cage at night. She was not allowed, to, again, one of them that was not allowed to go to the grocery stores. Like she was left out in the cold. This is one of the cases where she was put in handcuffs. She is one of the cases where they took porno- pornographic videos and put them on Pornhub, right? So we talk about that too, or we look at the porn industry and thinking it's a choice. Well, it's not always. And so I remember her coming into our program and I remember sitting with her and having this conversation of, well, who are you? You know, it it seems like such an easy question, um, but when your identity has been stripped from you, you have no idea. And so I remember sitting here and she's like, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And I was like, I remember telling her, well, then I'll dream for you until you can dream for yourself. And now you are a blank canvas and we get to put whatever we want to on that. And so I've had the awesome opportunity to do life where you start to see somebody so broken to when they start to believe in themselves, they start to get angry about their trauma, they start to find their voice, they start to use it. And then you start to see these little glimmers where they come up and they're like, I'm beautiful, I'm worth it. And they're sharing their affirmations with you. And you're like, yes. And so seeing somebody come from such brokenness into a space where they begin to find themselves again for me and and her it it has just been phenomenal and she continues to do it which is completely awesome even though she's not in our program the benefit is seeing that you've been able to plant the seed and actually seeing the fruits of your labor and And, seeing that that part for me is just the best and has been and so has she shared a dream with you or anything like anything come out specifically for that individual that you experienced? Yeah, she has. She has. Um, a part of that was that she was like, I never want to be in any form of relationship again, which is normal and, mm-hmm. and understandable to, I want to get married and I deserve it. Wow. I'll dream for I you until you can dream married. for yourself. Yeah, wow. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, so the work you guys are doing, again, I'm going to say it probably 50 times until we wrap up. Uh, it's just so inspirational and phenomenal. Mm-hmm. So if anybody wanted to contact uh, Generate Hope, uh, if they're in the San Diego area, or uh, wanted to find out more about the resources that you offer. And Jeff, I want you to chime in too for the reason you, you had said, you dial 911, anything practical that we can give our audience mm-hmm. uh, in regards to engaging with the resources you have to offer. Please generate hope.org. You can go to our website. We have additional information on human trafficking. We're not only based here in San Diego, we just opened our third home in Colorado as well. But to be completely honest, if you go to our info at generatehope.org, you can send us an email. So it's not that you have to just find resources in your area. Mm -hmm. Send us an email. Either me or one of my colleagues will get back to you. So you can just say, I'm interested in learning more information or what do I do if this is happening? And Mm -hmm. so being able to reach out to us, we reach back out and we have the network and resources to be able to give additional information if it's needed as well. So definitely go to our website if you have any questions. Awesome. Beautiful. And Jeff, you had said if someone sees something, they should just call 911. Just go right to the their local police department. Yeah, local police, if it's a if it's a minor 911, wherever you are. Um, you know, sometimes you might be traveling and you don't know what the local police number is. So just dial 911. You can't, okay. You can't go wrong. That, that makes sense. I want to do a quick shout out to Generate Hope because that organization is phenomenal. I mean, uh, Susan Muncie, who's their director of programs, is a, is a good friend of ours. She was also trafficked, uh, so she's a victim. And, and by the way, we try not to ever use the word prostitute. We try to call them what they are. They're victim survivors. 
And um, I, I recently went to a city of San Diego's, what they call John School. And that's a school where you have an option. So if you're arrested by the police for buying uh, a, a sex trafficker on the street or wherever, you, in San Diego City, you have an option if it's first time offense to go to John School or you know, go to court, go to jail, whatever it is, pay a fine. And so we we went to the school to find out what they're what they're teaching. Elon and I went, and we were appalled. Yeah. And it, oh dear. And, it's, and <laughs> it's not because the people that are involved in that program are not well intended, but they're uninformed to the point where they're actually creating the potential for more exploitation. So the good news is that they have asked us to come back, Keelan and I. And Corey and assist them in revamping the whole program. So, you know, wow, that's yeah. really interesting. Making an impact. And really quickly, Jeff, you had said, and Keelan, I think the founder of your organization, Generate Hope, that she was Susan, was a CNN uh hero to hero, 2018 yeah. hero. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And you can see that on yeah. your website too, right? Yeah. She's, yeah. She's, um, yeah, like Keelan, she's an amazing amazing person. So I've been so fortunate to have these people come into my life. And I have to tell you this, Kat and Jeff, that when Corey and I started this program, and you know, I'm a combat veteran, I've seen a lot of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Corey is a photojournalist, has seen it all. When we got involved in this program, we both got depressed, mean, physically depressed, Mm -hmm. because you know, here was this thing right in front of us that's the second lar- largest crime in the world, and people weren't doing anything about it. And you think, oh my God, you're letting this happen. And you can you can help, you know, avoid it. You can help it, you can mitigate it, you can end it uh, by saying something. Wow. So. It's a, the power that someone could have to, to make that happen. And when you talk about human trafficking and you talk about it being the second largest in the world, are you speaking of all different kinds of human trafficking? Because there is kind of a broader, right, uh, definition right. of that. Yeah. Can yeah, you, you just be specific about that really quickly? Yeah. So you have labor trafficking and then you have human sex trafficking. And the, the, the primary difference is that most people don't want to do anything about labor trafficking because they're in your garden, they're cleaning your house, they're working in the restaurants that you love to go to. And so they don't want to upset the apple cart. They're the oh, nannies really to just, your children. Oh my goodness. Versus versus really? sex trafficking. You know, that's a whole different, a whole different uh, ball of wax. Mm-hmm. And 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 the gangs are not nearly as involved in labor trafficking as they are in sex trafficking. So dollars and cents wise, sex trafficking is number two. Who, who is doing wow. who is doing the labor trafficking? Because when you're saying our, it could actually be your nanny, I, I'm kind of like, wait, how does that work? That, that more of that occurs uh, outside the United States. Okay, uh, and I should mention that ninety to ninety five percent of all the uh, uh, sex trafficking victims in the United States are U.S. citizens. They're not brought in from other countries. They're they're homegrown. That's surprising. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. That is, yeah. yeah. So is there uh, anything else we haven't covered that either of you would like us to know about or we should know about? You're kind of getting there right now with some other things. So lay it out. <laughs> well, I, I mean, one thing is, you know, we talk about San Diego County being our primary site, but now we're in the process right now of creating uh, a similar version of our training for uh, Beverly Hills, you know, Bel Air, that whole that whole area in Los Angeles, we're already, um, Keelan and I and Corey will be working with the DA's office, uh, Beverly Hills Police Department, uh, victim survivors, uh, the hotel and tourism industry. So we're, we're, the, we're being told that we're already becoming the national standard for our training. So, you know, it, from a business model standpoint, you know, we, we can come to a major area, LA, San Francisco, whatever. And we'll we'll create specialized training, impactful training in mm. your in your region. That's well, nice. you know, and you're offering it for free. I mean, this is really the kind of thing that Katrina and I are so excited to shout to the rooftops about because uh this kind of endeavor helping how can we all do something 
to make a difference in the world. You guys are living it out. So our Crazy Amazing Humans audience, our community, is very practical and also like to get involved. So I'm going to ask both of you, how can our community help support what you do if they're interested or be involved in some way? Uh, both Keelan and I, I think we have the same answer. Uh, all of these programs cost money. So, you know, if, if people want to get involved, you know, the first thing they can do is they can donate to Generate Hope. They can donate to the San Diego Harbor Police Foundation, uh, you know, so that we can then continue that work and, and create these um, amazing training opportunities and then hand it out to the world for free. You know, mm -hmm. so the more people in San Diego, we have we've trained over 4,500 people in three months. So that, you know, it's 4,500 people that got the training that didn't exist before. Wow. So for those of you needing to write this down, you're just listening, you're not watching the YouTube video, it's helpstophumantrafficking.org and generatehope.org. Is that also correct? Yeah. Yeah. Those are the two things you want to write down. I'm sorry, Kat, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I wanted to make sure we hear from Keelan before we wrap up. Uh, Keelan, if you'd like to add anything at this time, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely donations. But I am also like, if you have the time to volunteer, not just with our organization, maybe you're not located in the San Diego area. There are, there are different safe houses and resources that could really use the community and their support. Another way to be involved is what are the laws that are being passed? Um, what we're seeing right now is there's laws that being that are being passed that don't necessarily help us, but they hurt us. So what does that look like as well? Um, so just being well informed. And then again, outside of this, sometimes we're not called to volunteer or do, you know, legal things, but then how do we have the conversation in our home? If you're not in the space to help us and help your family and your communities. And powerful, powerful words uh, from both of you today. Thank you so much. It is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And thank you so much for making us all much more aware of what is happening out there, uh, sharing your stories, changing lives that you all have done, and offering this all up to our Crazy Amazing Humans community. Thank you so very much. And I will just have to say that you two are indeed crazy amazing. I want you So that's our show. A heartfelt thank you to Jeff Bowler and Keelan Washington for all the important work that they are doing to keep us all safe, but especially for making a difference in human trafficking from awareness to real solutions and assistance. If you've enjoyed today's episode and think it would be meaningful and helpful for someone you know, be a crazy, amazing human and let them know about this episode. All right. Remember to make sure and subscribe to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast wherever you get your podcasts so you can check us out on the Crazy Amazing Humans YouTube channel. Oh, and make sure and leave comments when you're there. We love to hear what you're thinking. That's right, Jefferson. And most of all, we want to make sure to thank you for being with us. Remember that every little kindness has the potential to create crazy, amazing human experiences one person at a time. And as always, this week, we want to encourage you to find one thing that you can do to extend kindness and love in the world. I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Katrina Carlson. Stay healthy, stay connected, and we will see you next time right here on the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. I want you to feel, I want you to feel something crazy, crazy amazing. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, please make sure to write us at crazyamazinghumans at gmail.com.